All right. So welcome to Apache Cassandra. So what are we going to do? We are going to take a look at Cassandra from the inside out and do a bunch of hands-on. But before we get started, let's actually talk about why are we talking about Cassandra? Why are we looking at a NoSQL? Databases were doing just fine, right? What's the key issue? Let's look at some of the reality of today. First of all, we are now talking about consumer oriented applications. Gone are the days where we had users in probably few dozens, hundreds, or maybe a few thousands. Enterprise applications usually had catered to a limited user base in the past. But these days we are talking about applications which are consumer facing e-commerce applications, media applications, all of these consumers around the world use. And when we are talking about consumers orient, consumer oriented applications, we are talking about users in the millions. So how can an existing setup, which is designed for a limited set of users scale to this kind of user base? When we are looking at consumers, let's extend that story. Can the consumers be predictable? I mean, can you tell a user, right? Oh yeah, that user, he or she is going to show up at 12 in the afternoon and stay on the system for 90 minutes. Can you predict that? Impossible. Given the fact that you can't predict consumer growth, how do you predict infrastructure growth? How do you predict how many infrastructure components will be necessary to service my customers? If I really don't know when these customers will come, how long they will stick around. So it's a really difficult task. Capacity planning becomes a serious challenge. 1990s, megabytes was the norm. Today we are talking about petabytes. Those are some of the largest systems. And very soon we are going to go beyond that as well. So now what is happening is terabytes is a household, enterprise household, you know, uh, unit of measure in terms of data. When we are looking at data that is generated at a rapid volume and the quantity of the data produced is also humongous, how can we have a system which arguably was designed in the 1970s? I'm talking about relational databases. The principles were defined long time ago. How can the age old principles agreed? You know, they say old is gold. Fine. Fair enough. But old is not necessarily always gold, especially in the uh, world of IT. So when we are looking at generating huge volumes of data, it is important for us to know how are we going to organize and manage this humongous volume of data? Is it going to work? how it used to let's just face it mankind has never been able to make a hardware machine that never fails and i'll tell you what failure is going to occur when you expect it the least for example you are just about getting ready for a demonstration to a very important client you hit enter and it blows up to high heavens 500 server error how about that or your manager stops by and you just hit enter and it says 404 page not found or something or the other will go wrong when you least expect it isn't that the reality so now we have two approaches one we can say look let us continue our quest to build a hardware system that never fails alternatively why don't we embrace the fact that failures will happen let us figure out how do we live with it how can we create an architecture that continues to function when there is failure? How about that? So let us assume we have a bunch of machines. One of them fails. We shrug our shoulders and said, yeah, that's okay. Let it fail. That's all right. No big deal. Right. My system is operational. I'll go back to it. Let me finish my cup of tea or whatever beverage you prefer. Right. Eventually, you'll definitely should be getting back to fixing that node. But isn't that something that is nice? Compare that with an RDBMS system. 
if the database goes down, you have to attend to it immediately. I'm not saying if things go down in Cassandra, you don't have to look at it immediately. All I'm trying to say is the severity of the impact of the database going down is your application is down, period. You can do your primary, secondary, failover, all of those kind of things you can do definitely, but you need to get to fixing the DB almost immediately. But in Cassandra, you have a little bit of a leeway, perhaps. V3, very important acronym in the context of Cassandra. Volume, velocity, and the variety of data. And this term has an impact in the way you model in Cassandra. When I say, how do you model in Cassandra? What I'm trying to say is, how do you create a data model in Cassandra that is designed to handle volume, velocity, and the variety of data? A very different way of thinking when you compare it with um, databases. In databases, you really don't care about the volume, ve velocity, as well as the variety of data when you're talking about modeling. That's the reality. Let's take a look at, at a high level, what it can do. How about this for an experiment? 330 infrastructure as a service um, from Google uh, Cloud Platform. There, it's called Google Compute Engine. And it was looking at a million writes per second. When you look at numbers like this, it's astonishing, isn't it? A million writes per second. Which database can stand tall and deliver something like this? What's more astonishing is the second line. Loss of one third of the instances and the infrastructure continued to function with a little bit of latency as expected, but there was no collapse to the infrastructure. You can find more of this, you know, here. And this happened in 2014, believe it or not. Let's take a look at what are, what are the companies that use Cassandra. This is just a representational list. Look at some of these numbers which is there in front of you. Netflix, 2500 nodes. Apple's cluster, not a single cluster, multiple cluster, 75,000 nodes. Now this is published, uh, you know, on, on the uh, internet and the source is given right here. But I'll tell you what, based on some recent uh, readings that I've done, that Apple's cluster is over 170,000 nodes. 170,000 nodes, that's a lot of nodes. And there's a lot of data that is being stored. So it's safe to say that traditional way of data management, traditional way of managing an infrastructure which is designed to handle data, right? That probably would not be the right fit in terms of technology to handle workloads like this. And by the way, it's only increasing. So I typically get a question, right? So how does this really, uh, you know, work in terms of comparing multiple NoSQLs? Perhaps the most common question is MongoDB. Obviously, Cassandra is the best. Needless to say that. Who's saying this? Data Stacks. What does Data Stacks do? They are the commercial arm of Cassandra. So do you th ever think that they'll, um, you know, say that, look, Cassandra is not really that good. Mongo is better. Do you expect that from them? Well, it could be from any commercial arm, wouldn't you agree? Right? So the question is, how does Cassandra stack up against MongoDB or some of the other databases? This question is actually invalid. It is very, very, you know, um, specific to the use cases that you're looking to implement. So maybe in some use cases, Mongo will be absolutely the perfect choice. Maybe in some cases, Cassandra will become the absolute right choice. So when we are looking at, you know, these kind of benchmarking, etc., right, I think we'll have to keep the use case in mind 
and then probably arrive at you know, the right selection of technology. I will talk about in terms of the core architectural differences among the different NoSQLs, right? But that's a little bit later. 